Today on Animal Outtakes... This is economic development in this bowl right here. From raising our own food using aquaculture to finding new ways to put invasive species on a plate, we're taking a look at how to put a more sustainable menu on our dinner tables. If you can't beat them, eat them. Hello and welcome to Animal Outtakes. I'm your host, Marcia Panucci. When it comes to our dinner table, there's a wealth of options on the menu. But thanks to some innovative scientists and adventurous chefs, there are some more unique plates being served up just in time for supper. Today, we'll look at how these groups are helping to create more sustainable menus. Let's eat. beautiful Saturday morning, more than a hundred children are learning an important lesson. And what are we learning here on the Fresh so Lake? So today is one of my favorite projects because the kids are learning how to catch fish. They're learning all about how to tie a knot and what types of hooks to use that don't damage the fish as much. This fishing clinic has a twist. It's focused on fishing practices like catch and release. At one point they're actually out there on the dock catching fish and they learn how to actually hold them and minimize the damage to the fish as they catch them, but they also learn the excitement of just getting involved with the nature and the fish themselves. There's another added benefit to programs like this one. Clinics like this help promote sustainability. Carol, we keep hearing the word sustainability, sustainability seems to be the new key word oh, that, yes. that we're hearing. Uh, what really is sustainability as it applies to moat and what you're doing out here today? Is sustainability is being able to not take away, but also to give back and give back to the waters that surround us, uh, keep it sustainable in that we can keep numbers of fish up that are available for both uh, human consumption or for fishing pleasure. The researchers at Moat Marine Laboratory have been working to develop sustainable practices for more than two decades. Their advancements can be seen especially when it comes to a popular species of fish. So tell us a little bit mm. about the schnook, because everybody talks about that here in Florida. I have to go snook fishing. Well, Florida is the five, it's a $5.3 billion recreational fishing industry. So, and snook is in the top 10 of those targeted fish. It's exciting when you catch a snook on a line. They have a lot of different moves before oh, you yeah, get them up, and right? They've got a lot of personality right. too. So um, the snook are um, really one of the most highly prized fish around here. And so without management on them, they would be definitely um, stressed out as a stock. One way scientists are helping is by spawning snook in controlled environments, a practice known as aquaculture. We've had partnerships and worked with snook for over 25 years, developing the methods in which to spawn them and to which to also on how to release them to get the best survival out into our local environments. One of our favorite species is common snook. It's a really interesting fish and um, it, it can survive in a variety of habitats, all the way from full strength seawater to freshwater lakes and rivers. Uh, that's part of uh, what attracts us to working with that fish. Moat scientists are always looking for opportunities to learn more about successfully raising these fish. Recently, more than 400 juvenile snook born at Moat's Aquaculture Park were tagged with transponders and released into Sarasota Bay. But before they were let go to join their wild counterparts, researchers tried an experiment. So we just started a study with uh, the snook to try to train them to be more wildlike in the wild. So <laughs> when they, because they're raised in tanks and they're just in a very controlled environment, they get pellets thrown in there, and so they just strike the food whenever they, whoever gets to the pellet first, basically gets the food. And what we have done is before releasing the fish, we have provided some of them with uh, group A, such with live food, 
and as they would catch out in the environment, their normal prey, along with habitat structure in their tanks to get them used to being able to hide under the structure um, and attack prey and so forth and know that they can hide because they're reared in a hatchery. And if it's just a basic tank, they don't learn those behaviors till they get out into the wild. We tagged these yearling fish that we're releasing with passive integrated transponders, pit tags. PIT. And um, then we set up antenna arrays in their nursery habitat, which in this case are creeks and rivers. And when those fish swim by, it records that fish. Which group is doing better? To date, the, so far the preliminary data looks like the trained fish are definitely doing better. Yeah, it, it helps them. Just a few days, even three to four days of training in the hatchery can really make a difference. In the whole scheme of things, in the world, yes. are we winning the battle for sustainability or not? Well, it's a slow process, and I think it's like baby steps, really. And I think Moat you know, is a leader worldwide in uh, presenting what you can do to be have a sustainable fishery. I think we are. We're on our way towards making bigger differences. We're making small differences here with the research. What we learn here gets applied on a larger scale later. I think we'll get there, but it's a slow battle, and really a big part of it is education of the public. Carol, why is a clinic like this for these children so very important in sustainability? This is a mechanism for us to teach stewardship of the environment. While Moat Marine Laboratory has decades of experience working in aquaculture, they are still developing a new and exciting aspect of the field, aquaponics. Kevin, aquaponics, it's a brand new word to many of us. Can you tell us what it really means? Well, aquaponics is where you are growing both fish and plants in the same aquaculture system. Essentially, they're raising fish, then using the nutrient-rich water the fish live in to grow sea vegetables. So what type of plants and what type of fish? Well, we're working with two types of plants, and I call them the edible sea vegetables. This is a quarter pound bunch of the sea purslane ready to go to the farmer's market. Now this one here, it really needs a new name. The common name for this product is called saltwort. I don't think that's a very appetizing name in the marketplace. The fish that we're growing are red drum or red fish. Right here from our local area, we have reproduced them here on the site. We have the moms and dads, we have made the eggs, and then we grew up the babies, and now they're ready to go to market. Why did Moat feel that this was so important? to tackle. Over 91% of the seafood that we eat in the United States is imported. We are producing almost none of that seafood here in this country. And half of the product that we're importing is produced by aquaculture in other parts of the world. And so what we're trying to do is develop the technology so that farming can happen in local communities to go to those local markets. And we're doing that right here with this aquaponics project. We have to get rid of the concept that our food can, is available all the time from everywhere and have some of that locally produced product that we know where it's being grown, can come out and see it on the, on the farm, and it's that farm to fork concept is what we're working on. The aquaponics project came to a realization in 2014. The facility was designed and built, then stocked with fish and plants. Since then, the product has been picked up by local restaurants who are putting the local sustainably grown fish and sea vegetables on their menus. How do you prepare this? Well, there's several different ways that you can prepare it. You could just eat the leaves right off of here, take them off, put them in as part of your salad, or you could uh, take a whole stem here and saute it in uh, you could butter. Eat this. Yes, absolutely, it's edible. And you could saute it in butter and garlic and add it to your pasta dishes. I've uh, had this both with the leaves and with the stem in quiches. That's a great way to fix it. It's a really nice. How do you like this it? This is very tasty, okay. extremely tasty. So right. I am impressed. Yeah. And it's not too salty. Right. Now the, the seafood that you are growing, what does it taste like once it gets onto our plate? 
Well, the fish tastes just like any fish that you might catch out in the wild, but it is grown in our controlled systems where we know what they're eating, we know where they're living, we know their whole life history, so they're a safe and sustainable product. And we aren't depleting the wild fisheries by growing them, so it's a great way to get the protein that we need, but it's a great tasting fish. What made you get interested in all of this? Um, I have been working in the field of aquaculture for 30 years because I know that the future seafood that we need is going to come from farming. Fish is the only product that we still hunt through fishing. At the days of that are beginning to close down and or be reduced. We just can't meet the protein requirements by fishing those products. And so what I've been doing throughout my whole career is working on developing the technologies to grow fishes or shrimps with the smallest impact on the environment possible. So have you made the strides? Are you winning the game? Well, we'll see if we can move this technology into commercial application. One of the biggest challenges we've had in the United States is that we have resisted the development of aquaculture in our country. And that's why everything that we're getting is being grown somewhere else. This is the type of system that I think people can understand and can support. From the farm to our tables, we'll show you how some restaurants are taking these sustainable fish and adding them to the menu. Very cool looking fish. A cool looking fish and a good eater. Yes it is. All right. Plus, it's a menace in the ocean, but delicious on our plates. The invasive lionfish finds a place where its presence is welcome. But first, an organic approach to dog treats. For thousands of years, we've been humans' best friend. You've been through a lot, and we've been right there with you. A dog is part of the family, a confidant, and a friend who always knows how to get into your heart. So what happens to our beloved companions when we can no longer care for them? This is why we've created Dante's Den, an innovative, state-of-the-art facility that will provide care for up to 100 dogs. Dante's Den is a community for joyful dogs. Millions of Americans face uncertainty when planning for the future of beloved pets who may well outlive them. Dante's Den is a charitable organization, so in whatever capacity you can, please lend your support so that we may continue this most wonderful work. Dante and I would like to thank you for watching and for also opening up your hearts to our wonderful community of joyful dogs. Learn about the many ways you could become involved by visiting dantesden.org. When faced with trouble with their dog, Maggie, Bob Fellows and his wife got to work and discovered that the issue was with her food. So we did some research with veterinarians and other dog store owners, and we came up with a formula that we had of flour and wet ingredients that we concocted our own recipe. And these are very nutritious. They're either organic or natural. In Ingredients. The result was a tasty treat that is simple enough to make at home. Yep. So why don't we just get to the kitchen and see here what we're going to do. So what do we have here? Well, in here I have garbanzo bean flour. Ah. <laughs> and then we have in here some sweet potato and pumpkin and applesauce and cinnamon. And that's been all mixed together. Ooh, that smells very good. And I've had people eat some of these and they tell me they Tastes like graham crackers. As Bob shows us, you mix all the ingredients together in a bowl until you have a soft dough. And this is the finished product when we mix it. Aha. Uh -huh. Right here. Now that so seems... It's very, very... Oh, it's very pliable. It's yep. very pliable. It's not hard. Actually, it looks a lot like pumpkin. The next step involves rolling out the dough. Bob has designed a special board and uses metal rods to make sure that each cookie is the same size. Now because the rods are a quarter inch thick, we know that that dough is a quarter inch thick and it's consistent through the whole match. The thickness of it is for the size of dogs. If you're going to use for smaller dogs, you want to have it thinner. 
and some people even want it thinner than this. Once the dough is rolled out, then you can use cookie cutters to make your favorite shapes. Now, when we do that, we have uh, a tray here that's all set up. And this is what we're going to put in the oven. And we're going to get it ready to bake. Now, what is the temperature on the oven? We, we bake them at 320 degrees. After a few minutes in the oven, these delightful delicacies are ready. And this is what they look like when they come out. Once they're out of the oven, the treats are cooled on a cooling rack. But before the dogs get to try them, I do a taste test of my own. Yes, you can yeah. have one. Can and we have one? Uh, yep, Ooh, if we warm. have people that eat them. Um, they're warm. Yeah. It's good. It's really good. <laughs> Get the coffee on. It's really good. I, th I taste more of the pumpkin coming okay. out. Okay. Right. Which I know the dogs absolutely love pumpkin. Yeah. And that's very healthy for dogs, too. We took the treats out to the dogs at Dante's Den, and they were a hit. Bob says he just wants to make sure the dogs get a high-quality, healthy treat. It's human-grade ingredients, and that's what you're feeding your favorite pet. And if you can eat it, they can eat it. And this is my philosophy. Coming up next... Oh my goodness. I just forgot what it really was. <laughs> it's outstanding. An eye-opening taste test. I see its teeth. <laughs> We'll be right back. <laughs> For thousands of years, we've been human's best friend. You've been through a lot, and we've been right there with you. A dog is part of the family, a confidant, and a friend who always knows how to get into your heart. So what happens to our beloved companions when we can no longer care for them? This is why we've created Dante's Den an innovative, state-of-the-art facility that will provide care for up to 100 dogs. Dante's Den is a community for joyful dogs. Millions of Americans face uncertainty when planning for the future of beloved pets who may well outlive them. Dante's Den is a charitable organization, so in whatever capacity you can, please lend your support so that we may continue this most wonderful work. Dante and I would like to thank you for watching and for also opening up your hearts to our wonderful community of joyful dogs. Learn about the many ways you could become involved by visiting dantesden.org. And now, it's time for Tales from Dante's Den. This is our senior citizen, Sophie. Sophie is a 14-year-old Shiba Inu. Sophie was surrendered to Dante's Den after her family felt they could no longer give her the attention and love she deserved. There are many stresses in families these days. There's children and there's double employment on the part of uh, the parents. And uh, Sophie, who was number one in the family, kind of found herself a little lost. They did the right thing, because here Sophie has blossomed. She's a happy dog. She loves to swim, she loves to run, and you would never know her age. You can tell a little bit about her from her muzzle, uh, but uh, that she's got a few little years on her, but she is definitely carrying those years well. Sophie is the type of dog 
that could adapt to just about any environment. She's just a love. In the Farm to Fork movement, scientists at Moat Marine Laboratory have the farm part down with their aquaculture park. But it takes restaurants and chefs to offer up the forks, so to speak. Ed, one of the words that we continue to hear, sustainable, sustainable, sure. sustainable. Sure. What does that really mean to us? Well, I think, uh, you know, as it relates to food, it's probably the most important movement that I've seen in the 36 years that I've been in business because of what it encompasses. It not only encompasses uh, local, uh, it, it, you know, it's not only about that we want to know where our food comes from now and we want to know ideally who makes our food and how they produce the food, how they grow the food. When we do that locally in a sustainable way, then that provides a great quality product. Ed Childs owns three restaurants that all have incorporated sustainable products on their menu. One that is particularly exciting is the Sunray clam. Uh, this is a clam that's always been here. Uh, you always see them when you go down to the be uh, beach and you walk around because the predators love them. You see the shells. After 12 years of research and development, scientists have finally been able to bring the Sunray clam to commercial production, much to the delight of shellfish lovers. Uh, they are sweet like conch. Uh, the way w these have been done, and they're the, one of the easiest things in the world to cook. You get a hot pan, you put just a touch of, just a touch of olive oil in it. Uh, you put those clams in there in that hot pan and let them sizzle. Hit them with a little bit of white wine and chicken stock. They open beautifully, like a butterfly, because they're oblong. And it, that dish cooks in about three minutes. Oh, it's divine. Mm. It is divine. Mm. <laughs> And sweet. Mm, mm, mm. Can I do this? Uh, because I'm doing what it. we call soften in the <laughs> south. That's the best part. A little shell, get the juice. Mm. Unbelievably. Isn't that nice? This is this is heaven. Another exciting development has been the use of invasive species on the menu. One in particular that is up and coming in the culinary world is the lionfish. Tell us about these lionfish. They are invasive. They are problems, they are. but according to you, they are great eating. They are fantastic eating. They're a very, very mild fish. Um, their flesh is white. It's, it's almost like a hogfish, if you're familiar with that. Um, they are very delicate and tender. They kind of have a maybe a flounder flavor. Other than the fact that they have venomous spines, Chef Eric Walker says the lionfish is a great fish to work with and delicious on the plate. Should I? Yeah, absolutely. Don't wait for me. Oh my. This is very tasty. Mmm. Mmm, mmm, mmm. While beautiful to look at, the lionfish are insatiable predators, eating up any kind of fish they come across. And they are heavy predators, and they end up denuding the reefs and eating a lot of the other fish. Uh, so they're looking for ways to try to control this. Uh, and one of the ways that they've, the best way they find, if you can't beat them, eat them. Uh, and so now they're really just trying to find the, 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 the efficient ways to harvest them. But there's a problem with making the lionfish as prominent as, say, the grouper or snapper. They've been very popular, but they're very expensive. Right now the fillets are about $18 a pound. Really? Yeah, and that's super high. So if we can get that price down, if we can get more efficient ways for people to, uh, to harvest them, uh, then I'm hoping that we can see more restaurants put this on the menu because for the consumer, it's a heck of a fish. Another invasive species that's made it from menace to menu is the wild boar. I think this is about taking lemons, the exotic <laughs> in space, in invasive species, and making limoncella. Really? I mean, this... These, and we serve the wild pig in all three of the restaurants, but this is a superior, nutty, uh, really, really got a rich, nice flavor to it. Well, you take that exotic species and you control it. We don't have to take them all out, but we can get the numbers in balance and we can do that and provide a really uh, top-notch gourmet meat. Now, Ed, I'm not so sure about this one because I know what they are. Yep. <laughs> but, but, all right. Oh my goodness. I just forgot what it really was. 
It's outstanding. Is that good? Mm hmm. Well, that's mm -hmm. really good. So I toast you, Ed. Thank you so much for having us today. What a pleasure. It's been wonderful. Thanks for your interest. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll be right back. For me, it started with one hit of sardines. Oh, sardines. That's where I learned to bake. It was easy to score free fish. I mean, hey, with this dolphin smile, yeah, it's illegal, but I, no one cares. I had a monkey on my back, but I was Jones for people food, hanging out under boats, dodging props and hooks, and doing dangerous stuff, stuff that uh, I'm ashamed to admit. Look, I know that I can kick this if people would just stop feeding me. Animal Outtakes is produced by Dante's Den Foundation, a nonprofit group dedicated to creating the best life for dogs. If you would like to learn more about Dante's Den, donate or volunteer, visit our website, dantesden.org. That's a wrap on this episode of Animal Outtakes. From invasive species like the lionfish and wild boar to farm raised fish and seagrass, there's plenty of ways to help cultivate a more sustainable menu. Join us again next week for another outstanding animal adventure. And if you look, when you press this, it falls. Okay. That's only less than you're getting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but you said pull it back. Yeah. Eh? Okay, okay. It does, it does, no. <laughs> it. Clinics like this help promote sustainability. That's all right. That's okay. That's it! I'm done! <laughs> Only a face a mother could love. <laughs> <laughs>